Good morning. To all who gather with us, those who are listening on the radio and others who are present with us via the live stream, we welcome you in the name of Christ as we gather and worship together. If you're visiting with us this morning, we are gladdened by your presence, and to everyone, we invite you to take a moment to sign the Friendship Register to let us know that you gather with us today. Today, a group from our community is worshiping in the mountains at Laurel Ridge Camp and Conference Center. Our pastor, Ginny, and director of Christian education, Margaret Norris, are joining them to spend the day outdoors together. We are grateful for the ministry of Laurel Ridge, and we pray today uh, for their leadership at this time. Next Sunday, June the 13th, beginning at 5 p.m., you are invited to worship with us on the Band Meadow in God's Acre. Parking is available in the adjacent Fine Arts Center. Uh, you can contact the church office for more information or visit us online at homemoravian.org. We join now our hearts as we listen to the prelude. We read the collect for this day from the Book of Common Prayer. O oh God, the strength of all who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers, and because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace that in the keeping of your commandments we may please you both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us rise and pray together the liturgy of creation beginning on page 26.
Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Princes and rulers, men and women, old and young together, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget none of his benefits. He forgives our sins and heals our diseases. He redeems our lives and crowns us with love and compassion. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice of our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, and confess our sins. Gracious God, we confess to you our sins, sins of oppression, when prejudice, fear, and hate rule our hearts, sins of neglect, when we and sins of greed. Lord, forgive us when we feed our anger and bathe in our despair. Hear now our confessions and know our hearts. Have mercy, O God, according to your unfailing love. Wash away all our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. Amen. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. of our Creator, let us affirm our faith. I believe in the one true God, the Father of humanity, who creates and sustains the universe in wisdom and power, who calls us into being and into relationship with God by grace, whose nature is love. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who lived that we might see God, who died that we might be reconciled to God, who rose again that we might experience the life of God, who freely accepts and welcomes all who come to him, 
not on the basis of their merit, but on the basis of his unconditional love. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who is God present with us now, who shows us our need for God, who assures us of God's love in all circumstances, and who lives the life and the love of Jesus Christ through us. In this faith, I will seek to live in harmony with God, with people everywhere, and with all of creation. Amen. We offer thanks to you, Creator God, for your artistry in frost and snow, in the icy stillness of winter, for new life bursting forth and blooming in spring. We thank you for sunshine and rain, and for growth in summer, which you nurture into the fruitful abundance of autumn. We thank you for the seasons of the Spirit, for joy and sorrow, for pleasure and pain, for gladness and grief, for friendship and solitude. We are grateful to you for your sustaining presence in all circumstances and for giving us the strength through which we can do all things. We pray for those who, because of greed or selfishness, exploit the gifts of the earth, that they may learn to be careful stewards of your creation. We pray for all who, by their commitment and involvement, are working to preserve our planet, that you would multiply their efforts. We pray for those who suffer from prejudice, poverty, or pain, that you would draw near to them and provide for them true justice and mercy. We pray for those whose lives are being wasted in careless living or despair, that they may find the joy of self-discipline and the hope that comes through Christ. We pray for your whole church, that it may become a powerful agent of reconciliation and renewal in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for all people, that everyone will recognize your awesome majesty and bow in obedient and joyful service. today beginning with Genesis chapter 3 verses 8 through 15. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And the Lord God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me She gave me fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, 
The serpent tricked me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. She will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. We read responsively now from Psalm 130, as printed in your bulletin this morning. Out of the depths have I cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. If you, Lord, were to mark what is done amiss, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you shall be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits for the Lord. And the word of the Lord is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the night watch for the morning, more than the night watch for the morning. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. With the Lord is plenteous redemption, and the Lord shall redeem Israel from all their sins. We read also today from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13, through the first verse of chapter 5. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We ask God's blessing on the reading of these words on this day as we sing together hymn 500, There is a Balm in Gilead.
reading continues today, Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 35. Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him. Hearing all that he was doing, they came to him in great numbers from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, beyond the Jordan, and the region around Tyre and Sidon. Jesus told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, so that they would not crush him, for he had cured many, so that all who had diseases pressed upon Jesus to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and shouted, You are the Son of God. But Jesus sternly ordered them not to make him known. Jesus went up the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, to be with him and to be sent out to proclaim the message and to have authority to cast out demons. So he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain Jesus, for they were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes, who came down from Jerusalem, said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around Jesus, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside, asking for you. And Jesus replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, reveal your word to us this day that we might have life in your name. Amen. From the moment that Jesus first begins his ministry with a pronouncement that God's reign on earth has come, he is constantly on the move. Traveling throughout the region of Galilee, Jesus' message and actions are consistent in their bearing witness to the arrival of God's new day. Calling disciples, announcing the forgiveness of sins, teaching and healing on the Sabbath day, sharing meals with the despised, becoming friends with the rejected, challenging the greedy, unsettling the comfortable, 
and taking notice of the many whose lives had been overlooked. The reign of God that Jesus proclaims is one that he himself is also demonstrating. The good news that he declares is made tangible in the manner and character of his daily life. And this is important because the good news of Jesus is not an otherwise invisible word, but a visible manifestation of God's presence in and for the world and a sign of the renewal of right relationships in a society that is filled with broken ones. It is no coincidence, therefore, that the crowds in today's reading are fascinated with Jesus and that they choose to follow him because he is willing to be among them and because he refuses to turn them away. And he refuses to turn them away because he loves them. He will not turn the crowds away because they are the reason for his ministry in the first place. Did you notice the many and varied peoples and cultures who were represented by the crowd? They are not singular. Hearing all that he was doing, as it says the gospel writer, they came to Jesus from throughout the region of Judea, including Jerusalem, from the region of Idumea, beyond the Jordan, and the region around Tyre and Sidon. In other words, they did not know each other. This listing of places would also surely have piqued the interest of a first century reader, not only because it spans a great distance, but because it echoes the land once given to the 12 sons of Jacob, an indication that this crowd, unbeknown to themselves, are by their own willing participation fulfilling the promises of God, establishing the foundations for what would later become the diverse community known as the church. So what today's reading makes clear and is the reason why we chose to read most of chapter three is because today's reading reveals not only that Jesus ministers among the crowd, but that after he does, The crowd doesn't just leave and go home. Instead, they continue to follow Jesus wherever he goes. And it is from among this crowd that Jesus also chooses 12 of his disciples to serve with him. And he does so on a mountain, echoing the scriptures yet again and bringing to mind the life of Moses, who went up the mountain at Sinai to meet with God and came down again to establish a community bound by a covenant promise who would be known as the people of God. The 12 that Jesus chooses are not other than the crowd. They remain as much a part of the crowd as Jesus does. And this 12 are appointed by Jesus to be with him, to proclaim the good news, and to have authority to cast out demons. In other words, to act with Jesus as co-workers and partners in the ministry of bearing witness to God's new day. And after this, the crowd leaves, right? No. The scriptures say that Jesus enters a house with his disciples, and again, the crowd follows him. And as a result, there are so many people in this house that they are falling out of the windows. Actually, it doesn't say that. But you get the picture. The gospel writer tells us that there is no room for them even to eat. Now, most English translations omit an important word here. A more literal reading of this verse would be to say, Jesus entered a house. Whose house? We're not sure. And again, the crowd came together so that they were not able to eat bread. Now, you might not think that the word bread matters very much here, except to tell us what was on the menu. But the mention of bread here is also representative of the meaning of the meal that they had planned to share together. Same as today, eating together is a profound gesture 
and who we eat with and who we don't says a lot about who we are and what we value. When we share our bread, we are sharing life together. Not only our time, but also our resources, our energy, the soil, the water, the very air that we breathe, it's all in there. We not only share what we have, ourselves, gifts, and resources, we are also affirming the gifts, voices, and stories of those who were gathered around the table. When we open our tables, we open not just our hearts, but also our lives. Thus, the sharing of meals together is not only fundamental to the forging of community, it is also the central practice of our faith. And as followers of Jesus, the sharing of bread is a sacramental practice wherein we are not only being reminded of the life of Jesus as the very life of the divine, we are also thereby becoming the body of Christ because we are what we eat. It is necessary to mention here that in Mark chapter 2, the religious authorities had spoken out already about the peculiarity of Jesus' meal-sharing practices. By eating with sinners, they said, it seemed to them as if Jesus was abandoning not only local custom, but also the divine law itself. The open table practices of Jesus, they said, were too reckless, too problematic, too loosey-goosey. So by the beginning of chapter 3, we learn that Jesus has, gotten him in, Jesus has gotten himself into so much trouble with those same authorities that they are already looking for a way to get rid of him. It's that serious. All of this, of course, would be quite alarming to the family of Jesus, whose own reputations are now also at stake because of Jesus' actions and discourse, so much so that they are willing to say publicly that they believe he has literally gone out of his mind. So when the word gets out that Jesus is welcoming around his table a bunch of strangers from who knows where, they decide that it is time to intervene. And come to find out, the rumors are also spreading now to Jerusalem, such that the religious authorities there are rumbling, and they decide to come down and see it for themselves, what sort of shenanigans Jesus has gotten up to now. After all, who does he think he is? And what could possibly be the meaning of all of this? From this point forward, the story plays out like a Netflix miniseries, filled to the brim with drama and suspense. The scribes from Jerusalem arrive first, while Jesus' family is still on their way, intending to physically restrain him. Jesus, knowing that the scribes are outside and overhearing their accusations that he is behaving as though possessed by evil spirits, invites them inside so that they too may join him with the others. They enter the house and no doubt find his disciples and the crowd sitting around him. And it is there, Jesus explains to them in a parable that their accusations are missing the point. How can you see the signs, Jesus says, of people's hearts and lives healed and renewed and transformed and turned around and say that God has no part in that. Can't you see that people are being set free from the many ills that weigh them down? Can't you see the love upon their faces? Can't you see the hope in their eyes? Can't you see that their lives are made better because they are sitting here around this table with each other? You, of all people, as teachers of God, should know better how to spot the signs of God's presence. There is no evil spirit here, Jesus says, in so many words. It is the Holy Spirit who is at work in this house. And if you can't see that, then keep looking. And if you can see that, 
and still you refuse to be a part of it, then the shame is on you. The gospel writer notably does not record a response being given by the religious authorities. We can only assume that they left without saying a word. Meanwhile, Jesus' family shows up. And rather than entering the house themselves for fear of becoming associated, instead they call for Jesus to come outside. Members of the crowd overhear Jesus' family calling for him, and they approach Jesus to let him know, hey, your family is here. They're asking for you. Family, Jesus answers. And looking around at those who were sitting in the circle with him, Jesus says, here, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister, and my mother. Now the significance of Jesus' words in these verses cannot be understated, but they can be misunderstood. Jesus is not rejecting the family outright, nor is he suggesting that our familial ties don't mean anything. But what Jesus is saying is that all of our relationships, even our closest and most intimate ones, are to be subject to the desires and the purposes of the divine. Because when that happens, when our lives are open to the presence and influence of the Holy Spirit, we will find ourselves redrawing the lines of kinship and of commitment and of fidelity. Consistent with Jesus' own actions in the previous verses, Jesus' priority throughout his life and ministry is the declaration that God's kingdom has arrived, the demonstration that God's reign on earth has come. So if the gospel of the kingdom extends the boundaries of those with and to whom we belong, then that same gospel also alters the boundaries of those to and with whom we are responsible. Jesus insists that the community of those who would be known as the church is a community that is unwilling to accept the status quo, but lives empowered by the Holy Spirit to creatively and lovingly engage the people of this world, driven to accompany one another amid the burdens of this life, offering more than platitudes and politeness but a willingness to lean into the redemption and newness that God alone makes possible. And much like the ministry of Jesus, there surely are signs when the church embraces its mission to be the sent people of God. The church is not just a nice place that some people maybe like to visit sometimes, but a community of those who are being transformed by the gospel and so empowered by God's own presence to live a life that is an answer to the calling of God. A people who are sent not simply to make peace, but to announce that God's peace has come near. A dynamic fellowship who in and through the love of God's own self are bearing witness to the reign of God every time we gather around the table. Because the table is not simply a sign of God's kingdom. The table is the kingdom. And the good news that Jesus both is and proclaims is none other than the establishment of a people with ties that bind. A new community of neighborliness who are dedicated to enacting the common good and to preserving the life and dignity of every human person whose character is to fulfill by God's grace through the energy of the Holy Spirit the promise of a faithful love and justice that demands something of us. Not merely a foreshadowing of a salvation that is to come, but as a redemption that is a here and now reality. Togetherness for the church is not merely a nice idea for reflection, but is an accomplishment of the salvation that is won by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, 
who bestows the Spirit upon the church that we may be part of the continuation of the ministry of Christ until he comes. And that means that the church is called to be a community that genuinely reflects the rich array of hues and colors that comprise the human experience. But we cannot be that church if we refuse to lean into the Spirit's presence in our midst today. We cannot be that church if we think that Jesus needs to be restrained by our own ways. We cannot be that church if we intend to manage the guest list. And we cannot be that church if we insist upon setting a table only for ourselves. We need also learn what it means to be a part of the crowd and to become willing to be a guest at the table of our neighbors. Because the question for us today is not just whether we are willing to set a table for others to gather. The question is how far we are willing to go to be a guest at the table of Jesus. Let us not resist a work of God that we have never seen before. God can do a new thing. So instead of looking only to what is familiar, let us pray for the eyes to see and the ears to hear and the mind to perceive and the heart to be receptive to all that God is doing among us even now that we may respond to God's invitation with yes and amen. Because the doors of God's kingdom are open and the table is wide for all who will gather. So may our lives become a sign that God's reign on earth has come, that we may sit together at the table of Jesus and see who shows up. Amen. Let us sing now together hymn 578, Jesus' hands were kind hands. It's still good to see your faces. And it's good to know of the many who continue to participate with us from afar. It is good to know that God still gathers us together. As we share in this time of reflection, of giving, um, we give thanks for the empty chairs. And we pray to be a people who will work together to discern God's way among us and to go out 
and to sit at table with one another and to participate in the life of the kingdom here and now. Make us willing today, O God, to follow you with all that we are. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. And we continue now in prayer for the church and for the world.
Holy Spirit, we pray to notice you. Wherever we are, wherever we may go, we ask that you lead us, that we may become familiar to the movement of your presence of love in this world. Make us a church whose love is brave. Make us a church whose love is faithful. Make us a church whose love will listen. Make us a church whose love is creative and strong, open to the new possibilities that you are working among us even now beyond anything we would even dare to ask or to imagine. Overcome our resistance to your purposes, our hesitancy to your desires, our obstinance to your intentions, our indifference to your justice. Reclaim us today to serve you without fear. Unlock our stubbornness to accept the ways where we have erred whether by our words or by our silence, by our actions or by our own complacency. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to receive and to celebrate the signs of redemption and hope, of your engagement, of your healing, of your transformation in our neighborhoods in our community, in our city, and among those with whom we live and share our lives. Widen our circles to be circles of invitation, our tables to be tables of welcome, our embrace to become an instrument of your embracing. Use us each and every one that our lives may glow with a refreshing newness of vision and courage. Open our hands with generosity and our doors with an abundance of joy that we may tend to the suffering and be known as the people of Jesus, not for our sakes, but for the sake of the good news that you are ever making known. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let us rise and sing together hymn 640, Christ for the World, we sing.
May you go and be a guest at the table of Jesus by the love of God that is for you and by the Holy Spirit with you and in you now and forevermore.